فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam brother chairman the Sheikh al Islam of Trinidad and Tobago, Maulana Siddiq Ahmad Nasir, the distinguished scholar of Islam and the Imam of the Imam Memorial Masjid, Sheikh Saeed Ahmad. Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Surah Al Nahl of the Quran, Surah number 16. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one God, the God of Abraham, alayhi salam, he declares, and we sent down the book, that is the Quran, sent it down on thee, O Muhammad, sallallahu ta'ala, alayhi wa sent down this Quran that it might explain all things. And therefore that it might explain the strange world in which we live today. And therefore that it might explain the strange events that are constantly unfolding in the Holy Land. The Holy Land is not Mecca and Medina. Not in the Quran. The Holy Land is not Banaras. Not in the Quran. In the Quran, the Holy Land is that land in which the state of Israel is now located. Otherwise known as Palestine. The Holy Land. Strange events are unfolding in the Holy Land. This Quran has come to explain. And this Qur'an has come to guide. Guidance does not come from Islamic organizations or from the University of the West Indies or from Whitehall or from the Trinidad Guardian or the Express. Guidance comes from this book. That explanation and that guidance have come as rahmah an act of kindness from the Lord. And for those who have the good sense and the wisdom, and who make the effort to go into the book and study the book of Allah, and search for that which explains and that which guides, and then they accept and they embrace and they apply it in their lives. Bushra lahum good news and glad tidings for them. <coughs> they will understand what others cannot. They will succeed when others will not. The Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam declared every prophet warned his people about the Antichrist, about Dajjal, the false messiah. And the prophet Noah warned his people. But I, I say to you something that none have said before me. The Antichrist sees with one eye, his left eye. 
He is blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord is not one eye. <coughs> Between his eyes, on his forehead, is written the word kafir, disbeliever. And every mu'min will be able to read it. A mu'min is the one who has accepted the religion, the true religion, but has not only accepted it with the lips, but the truth has entered into the heart. The one who has faith is a mu'min. And so every mu'min will be able to read and recognize this believer. Whether that mu'min is literate or illiterate. Well then why is it that the one who is a disbeliever cannot read? How come? The one who has faith can read. The one who has no faith cannot read. So maybe we should send him to the eye specialist to have his eyes examined. Why can't you read? But the report comes back from the eye specialist. Perfect vision. No glaucoma. No cataract. His eyes are perfect. Well then why can't he read? Even though his eyes are perfect. And why is it that the one who has faith can read and recognize Kafir, disbeliever? Maybe that the one who has faith is not reading with these eyes. Do we have any other eyes beside these eyes? Do we have any other ears beside these ears? Do we have any other means of acquiring knowledge other than true sense perception and rationality, <coughs> true observation? The modern godless world says no. The Quran says yes. The Quran says that the heart can see. The Quran says that the heart can hear. When faith enters into the heart, then Allah puts nur in the heart, light. And with that light the heart can see what these eyes cannot see. And so now it is plain and clear that when the one who has faith is seeing, he's seeing with more than these eyes. He's seeing with the heart. And so now it is also plain and clear that when the Dajjal sees with the left eye, it symbolizes external vision. When the jar is blind in the right eye, it symbolizes internal blindness. With this introduction, we understand now that when we're dealing with the subject of the Antichrist, there is a lot of symbolism involved in it religious symbolism which needs to be interpreted. In previous lectures we were told about a divine promise which was communicated to the Israelite people that Allah was going to send a prophet 
who will be known as Al Masih, the Messiah, and who would rule the world with justice, confirmed by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, he would be Hakimun Adil. He would rule the world with justice. From the throne of Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, the Prophet David, and with a rule which would be eternal. <coughs> but when that promise was communicated, the Israelites were out there in Babylon, and the Holy Land was occupied. The Israelite people understood that if the Messiah was to fulfill this divine promise, there were certain logical implications which followed. Number one, that he would have to liberate the Holy Land. Number two, that he would have to bring the believers back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Number three, that he would have to restore the Holy State of Israel, founded by David and Solomon. Allah's blessings be upon them. And number four, that this Holy State of Israel would have to become once again the ruling state in the world. And then the Messiah could rule the world from the throne of David alayhi salam with a rule which would be eternal. <coughs> After almost a hundred years in Babylon, Suddenly, things began to happen, and the Holy Land was liberated. The Persian Empire defeated Babylon, and the Israelite people were allowed to return to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own, and to restore the Holy State of Israel, and the Temple, or the Masjid, built by Solomon alayhi salam was rebuilt and so the Israelite people are now excited the excitement has reached fever pitch the Messiah must be around the corner the golden age is coming back we're going to rule the world one more time. And sure enough, the Messiah came. But when the Messiah arrived, the son of Mary, while some of them accepted him, the establishment, the rabbis, the priests, rejected him. Why did they reject the Messiah? Answer, because Allah tested them. And because they were seeing with only one eye, they failed the test. They said, They said that his mother had committed that enormous sin. And they said, that this baby was a bastard. If they had seen with two eyes, with the internal eye, then they would have known, oh no, appearance and reality were completely opposite to each other with this baby. That sh she was still a virgin, and she gave birth to the baby. But they did not see with the internal eye. <coughs> and today's lecture, 
reminds this speaker and the audience that unless we see with the internal eye, we will be deceived in so many different ways. And then when they saw him die on the cross, before their very eyes, oh, he could not have been the Messiah. Why? He's dead. He's dead. And the Holy Land is under Roman occupation. He's dead. He never ruled the world from the throne of David, alayhi salam. The golden age never came back, but he's dead. And so it is now confirmed beyond the shadow of a doubt. He could not have been the Messiah. What they did not know, and no one knew, for 600 years, no one knew it, until the Quran came down. Was it, no, they did not kill him. No, they did not crucify him. But rather, appearance and reality were completely opposite to each other. And Allah raised him. And one day he's coming back. And when he comes back, regardless of resolutions of the Security Council of the United Nations, when he comes back, he is going to rule the world. He will rule the world with justice. And he will rule the world from the holy state of Israel, built on the foundations of the religion of Abraham, alayhi salam. And that is Islam. And his rule will be eternal. But they did not know that. And so they're waiting for the Messiah to come. <coughs> Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, then informed that Allah had created a being and Allah had committed to that being the mission of impersonating the Messiah. pretending that he is the Messiah. So he is the great pretender. And that he is known as Dajjal. Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Dajjal, the false Messiah or the Antichrist. <coughs> Dajjal means one who deceives. And so the Antichrist has a PhD in deception. In everything connected with the Antichrist, appearance and reality are opposite to each other. If the Antichrist is to successfully impersonate the true Messiah. It follows that he also must attempt to rule the world from Jerusalem with what would appear to be eternal rule. Only then can he declare, I am the Messiah. If he is to do that, and convince the Jews that he is indeed the Messiah, then it follows logically, number one, he would have to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. Number two, he would have to bring them back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. 
Number three, he would have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and get them to believe that this is the Holy Israel of David and of Solomon Of course it would not be, it would be an imposter. Then they would be convinced. And finally, he would have to cause that state of Israel to become the ruling state in the world. Only then would he be able to rule the world from Jerusalem. And then he can get up and say, I am the Messiah. And they would believe that he is indeed the Messiah. And then he could rub his hands and he can say, Mission accomplished. A Gidema 6 for a 9. The Prophet Muhammad <coughs> once suspected that a Jewish boy in Medina was the Antichrist. The boy's name was Ibn Sayyad. So he took his companion Omar radiallahu ta'ala with him to go and question the boy. The boy was very uh, disrespectful in his answers. And Omar radiallahu ta'ala who was very angry. He said, O Messenger of Allah, give me permission. I cut off his head. The Prophet said, No, Omar, no. If he is the Antichrist, you cannot kill him. And if he is not, then it would be sinful to kill him. May I repeat that? So it sinks in. If he is the Antichrist, you cannot kill him. And if he is not the Antichrist, it would be sinful to kill him. Implying that the possibility exists that he can be the Antichrist. Or the jam. But that possibility could only exist if the Antichrist has been released into the world. And so implicit in this event is a message which, be, which is being communicated to the world that the release of Dajjal, the release of the Antichrist into the world, took place in the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad <coughs> If he is released into the world, then where is he? We now come to another intriguing event. It is located in the Sunan of, in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. A companion of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, who was, he was Christian, he became Muslim. His name is Tamim Dari. He came to the Prophet and narrated an event which occurred. The Prophet listened and then he said to the people, sit down, I have something to say to you. Tamim Dari 
came to me and told me something about the Antichrist which confirms what I have been saying to you. And now we get the story from the blessed lips of the Messenger of Allah. What is the story? <coughs> Tamim al-Dari and some 30 or 40 of his companions went on board a ship. And then the storms came and blew the ship for a whole month before they arrived at an island. And when they got on shore, they got off the ship and they went on shore, they were confronted by a very hairy creature. Plenty hair. So much hair, you could hardly tell which side is head and which side is tail. <coughs> And then this creature spoke and said, I am Jassasa, Jassasa, spy. Surat al-Hujurat, wala tajassasu, do not spy. So this is an island with a lot of people who excel in spying. And then Jasasa pointed to a monastery. There's someone waiting to see you there. So they rushed to the monastery. <coughs> and there they found this young man, powerfully built, with curly hair. But there's no description about his eyes. His hands were chained to his neck. His feet were chained. And this man began to question Tamimudari and his companions. A number of very interesting questions. Could someone please send a copy of Jerusalem in the Quran for me? <coughs> a number of very interesting questions. But I don't have time to tell you all of them. And then he said, I, I am Dajjal. I am the Antichrist. And when I am released, so up to this moment he's not as yet released. And when I am released, thank you. <coughs> I will enter every town and every city, including Tunapuna. But I will not be allowed to enter into Mecca and Medina because the angels will bar me. And so now we know, up to this moment in time, the Antichrist is not as yet released. But he is on an island, which is about one month's journey away from the Arab world, by sea. An island which has excellence in spying. And so now we know that when the message came from the Messenger of Allah, that the Dajjal has been released. We know that it is in this island that he is going to be released. And it is from this island that he will launch his mission to impersonate the Messiah and to eventually rule the world from Jerusalem. Question. Which island is it? Before we attempt to answer the question, 
Let us turn to another hadith, another statement of the Prophet ﷺ, which is of crucial importance. It is also in Sahih Muslim. <coughs> he said that when the Antichrist is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. 40 days. Yawmun kasana. One day, like a year. Yawmun kashahar. One day, like a month. Yawmun kajum'a. One day, like a week. Wasairu ayyamihi ka ayyamikum. And all his days, implying all the rest of his days, would be like your days. When his day, now listen carefully, <coughs> when his day is like our day, he would be in our dimension of time. And when he is in our dimension of time, then we can see him. At that time, of course, he would be, said the Prophet ﷺ, a Jew, a young man, powerfully built, with curly hair. Where would he be at that time? Of course, he would be in Jerusalem. Ruling the world from Jerusalem, the way the rule, the way the world is now ruled from Washington. But where would he be when he's released on earth? In a day which would be like a year. And where would he be on earth in a day which is like a month? And where would he be on earth in a day which is like a week? Do we have answers for that? Praise be to Allah who allowed this servant Imran to study international relations, international politics, international economics. <coughs> the answer, of course, is that when he's released on earth, he would be on that island. And from that island, he will launch his mission to liberate the Holy Land, to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land, to reclaim it as their own to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and get the Jews to believe that this is the Holy Israel of David and of Solomon salam, and to cause that state of Israel to become the ruling state in the world. Which island is it? This is my answer. You do not have to agree with me. You are free to defer with me. But you cannot say that I am wrong until you can tell me what is the right answer. That's fair, isn't it? That's fair, isn't it? Come on, answer me. You cannot say that I am wrong until you can tell me what is right. An amazing thing has happened. That nowhere in the world, praise be to Allah, has anyone come forward so far to defer with me and to challenge me. Not one. Until I came to Trinidad. <laughs> in August. And one, 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 one fellow in Trinidad challenged me 
In November of 1917, the British government did something which was incredibly strange and mysterious. A Briton, which is now the prince of the secular world, the secular world takes religion out of politics. And Britain is the prince of the secular world. Britain issues a declaration known as the Balfour Declaration. In November 1917, that it is the intention of His Majesty's government to work for the establishment of a Jewish national home in the Holy Land. Did you hear that? The only thing stranger than that that ever occurred in history was the day that the cow jumped over the moon. Why would a secular state, which leads the world of secular states, declare its intention to work for the establishment of a Jewish national home, meaning a Jewish state, in the Holy Land. <coughs> Two months later, this was October 1917, in December 1917, it is a British army led by General Allenby, which defeats the Ottoman Islamic army and liberates the Holy Land. And when Allenby entered into Jerusalem, the British general declared, today the Crusades are over. Oh? Oh, but the Crusades were supposed to have been Christian wars. And you are now a secular state. You're not a Christian state, you're a secular state. How come a secular Britain is continuing a crusade started by the Pope a thousand years before? That's strange. That is incredibly strange. Between 1918 and 1948, it is the island of Britain which ruled over the Holy Land on a mandate conferred by the League of Nations. And during that period of time, with tremendous deception while pretending to keep the Jews out, Britain opened the doors for the Jews of Europe to enter into the Holy Land and to reclaim it as their own. In between came the interlude of Adolf Hitler. <coughs> <coughs> which speeded up the movement of the Jews from Europe to the Holy Land. In 1948, Britain did something strangest of all. Britain is a state with a tremendous commitment to the rule of law. And so every time Britain decolonized, there was always an insistence of a legal transfer of power. And then you had the flags going up at midnight. Huh? 
and the national anthem and the constitution and so on. A legal transfer of power. It happened in Trinidad as well. But in 1948, when Britain left the Holy Land, she left like a thief in the dark. For the first time, for the only time in British history, there was no legal transfer of power from Britain to the successor state. In 1948, Britain acted as a midwife for the baby to be born. The European Jewish state of Israel. And so my answer is that that island of Tamimudari is Britain. <coughs> the Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, about Dajjal. That he would ride on a donkey. And the donkey would travel as fast as the clouds. And the donkey would have his ears stretched out wide. My opinion, which I hope you will share with me, is that that donkey is already here in the world. This is religious symbolism with which we began the lecture. The donkey is the modern aircraft. And since the Antichrist brings with him the modern aircraft, the Antichrist commands the skies. You can't, you cannot compete with him or rival him in power in the skies above. He said that the Antichrist will step into the ocean and the water would reach him up to his knee. Again, I want to suggest to you that we are dealing with religious symbolism here. It is not to be understood literally as a donkey. It is not to be understood literally as a man who is a few miles tall. Rather, it is the technology which allows you to go down to the bottom of the ocean and pick up pieces of an aircraft which crashed and reassemble the aircraft 95%. That technology is in the world today. The Antichrist would be jumping about between the heavens and the earth. Jumping about, said the Prophet. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Again, I want to suggest to you that this is not to be interpreted literally, that we are dealing with religious symbolism. It refers to our modern exploration of the heavens above, the satellites that go around the earth and the shuttle aircrafts that go up and down. In fact, <clears throat> in all of these we see pointers towards a scientific and technological revolution which would sweep the world and the mastermind behind that scientific and technological revolution is the Antichrist. He said that the earth, the earth, would yield, the earth would yield its treasures to Dajjal. Now, go back home and study British history.
as I am doing now. And you would see that the scientific and technological revolution was led by the island of Britain at every significant step of the way. The earth would yield its treasures to the job. Last year, <coughs> my wife and I visited the city of Kimberley in South Africa. Kimberley is famous for its diamonds, the Kimberley diamonds. Somewhere around the middle of the 19th century, a little African child was playing and discovered a stone that was sparkling. The child took the stone back to his father. The father took the stone to the European Commissioner. The European Commissioner sent the stone to Johannesburg. And when they examined the stone, they found that it was one of the biggest diamonds that had ever been discovered. And that was the, the trigger that now led to the exploration for diamond and gold <coughs> in southern Africa. But it was British technology at work to discover the diamond veins down deep down in the earth. Without that British technology, you could not have done it. And then they began to dig these huge man-made holes. And in Kimberley, we saw the biggest one of all. My wife and I stood at the, at the, the edge of this big hole, big hole. You could put a couple of aircraft down inside there. And way down at the bottom of the hole, way down deep inside the earth, they went and they mined the diamonds. Out of that Kimberley diamond mine, they extracted, you know, a wheelbarrow? Well, there were five wheelbarrows at the side of the mine there. And they were filled with plastic nuggets. And this was meant to show us how many diamonds were mined at Kimberley before the mine was closed down in 1914. All of that effort of digging this big, 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 big hole in order to get five wheelbarrows filled of diamonds. <coughs> In 1914, the stage was set. The Zionist movement had taken control of the diamond mines of South Africa and used a man named Cecil John Rhodes as a front man. The Rothschild Bank of Europe, a Jewish bank, financed him, and they were able to get to harvest all those diamonds and then use the sale of those diamonds to build up a war chest. So by 1914, they could close it down. I want you to recognize that Britain was the leader of the world in the technology which led to all of this. The Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam the Dajjal, the age of Dajjal or the Antichrist would also be the age of riba. Riba, one form of riba is borrowing and lending money on interest. But another form of riba is a transaction based on deception 
which yields a profit or a gain to which one is not justly entitled. In other words, what the Americans call a ripoff. Today, the whole world, the economy around the world, is in the grip of riba or usury. But notice that the modern riba economy originated from Britain. It is the Bank of England which was established at the end of the 17th century. The Bank of England which began the effort, which spearheaded the effort for the establishment of today's modern riba economy. Not only through lending and borrowing and interest, Britain became the money lender of the world. But more than that, to substitute real money with paper money. It is Britain whose Bank of England at the end of the 17th century who began to issue the first paper currency. And once you begin to issue paper currency, your capacity for establishing a riba economy is now tremendously enhanced. But we have a lecture on this subject coming up, Islam and the international monetary system. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, <coughs> that the last people to come out to Dajjal or the Antichrist will be women. The last people to come out to Dajjal or the Antichrist will be women. And a man would have to return to his home and tie down his wife and sister and daughter to protect and preserve them from Dajjal, the Antichrist. Indicating that when Dajjal's mission is close to its climax, something strange is going to sweep the world of women. That they are going to be deceived, utterly deceived that what would appear to them to be the road to progress, which they will eagerly grasp and embrace, what would appear to them to be a revolution in the world of women, the likes of which mankind never witnessed before, would in fact be the Jal's deception. I believe you will share with me the view that the prophecy of the Blessed Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, is today being unfolded in the modern feminist revolution and its so-called struggle for women's liberation. That also is a topic which is coming up in our series of lectures. But do you know that Britain, the island of Britain, initiated and led the feminist revolution? I present all of this information to you to argue the case that the island in the Hadith of Tamim Dari is the island of Britain. Now then, I notice <coughs> that when the jar is released in a day which is like a year, and Britain is his headquarters, I notice as a student of international relations, I notice that Britain strangely, strangely, strangely becomes 
the ruling state in the world. Come on, you explain to me. How do you explain a little obscure island off the coast of Europe, which never walked on the stage of history, an island that Napoleon contemptuously dismissed as a nation of shopkeepers, how do you explain that that little island establishes its rule over the whole world? Pax Britannia. Britain rules the world. I want to suggest to you tonight that the only man who can explain the emergence of Britain as the ruling state in the world at the time when it emerged is a man named Muhammad. Allah's blessings be upon him. And the explanation is that this is the work of the Antichrist. In 1914, if you would go back and do some research, you will find as yet <coughs> air power has not as yet come. Your armies commanded the land and your navy commands the sea. And Britain, Britain controls the seas of the world. In 1914, Britain commanded every strategic naval port in the whole world. This was not by accident. It is time for us to sit back now and read history once again. It is because Britain was poised at that moment, commanding the seas around the world. And the, the Zionist movement had accumulated this vast chest of money to the diamond mines of South Africa, <coughs> that in the summer of 1914, they were ready to strike with an act of terrorism. An act of terrorism which changed the world. I want to suggest to you that the authors of that act of terrorism in the summer of 1914, through which the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo, are the same authors who planned and executed the September 11 attack on America. There are those who will not be convinced. They will say, no, CNN does not lie. The American government does not tell any lies. No. They said that it is Arabs and Muslims who attacked America on September the 11th. And we are convinced that they are speaking the truth. But guess what? One day, we stand in another court. On that day, the Quran says, Yawma idhin tuhaddithu akhbaraha. The earth will reveal all the secrets that the media don't tell us today. And on that day, I will not be surprised. When I am seen, I am shown who are the authors of the September 11 attack on America. I would not be surprised on that day. But on that day, those who insist that Washington is speaking the truth, oh, what an awful event it will be for them. See, you know that? I mean, these people are going to give me a six for a nine. I was so utterly and totally and completely deceived, and I swallowed their lies. And as a consequence, I blamed an innocent people. 
and today I have to answer for it. In the summer of 1914, <coughs> there were six major powers in Europe. Britain, France, Russia, Germany, Austria, Hungary, that's five. That's five. Number six. Number six. Uh -huh. Who remembers number six? Number six was the Ottoman Islamic Empire. I mean, we forget about it. Six major powers in Europe. And the Holy Land was under the control of the Ottoman Islamic Empire. The Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. And the fingerprints or the footprints, which were of course manufactured, led to Russia. It was intended to lead to Russia. Like September 11 footprints or fingerprints was intended to lead to Arabs and Muslims. Hmm? And so Austria-Hungary declared war on Russia as George Bush attacked Afghanistan. And then Britain and France, who had a defense treaty with Russia, now came to the assistance of Russia and joined the war. And then Germany entered the war on the side of Austria-Hungary. And then the Ottoman Islamic Empire was pushed, shoved into the war on the side of Germany. And so the stage was set, as the stage is now set today after September 11th. And the big war took place. But strangely, <coughs> Britain was losing that war. Because Germany unveiled a new weapon of war that had never been used before, the submarine. As Israel is going to unveil a new weapon of war tomorrow that has never been used before. And when Britain was on her knees, facing defeat, Britain, which was the ruling state in the world, is now facing defeat. Then the German Jews went to the British government and said, let's make a deal. If you will promise to give us the Holy Land, we'll bring the United States into the war on your side. Britain said, deal. You will see all of this on the last day. And so the United States entered into the war. And Britain won the war. In the process, the Ottoman Islamic Empire was defeated, was dismembered, and the Holy Land was liberated for the Jews. And so an act of terrorism led to this strategic target being achieved, the liberation of the Holy Land. But now, the United States takes over from Britain as the new ruling state in the world. In the same way that Britain had a mysterious relationship with the Holy Land and with the Jews, the United States now has that mysterious relationship with the Holy Land and with the Jews the first country in the world to recognize the state of Israel is the United States of America. Is that by accident? No, not after today's lecture. You'll never think it's by accident. The United States presents, <coughs> excuse me, presents the baby with everything that the baby needs to grow up to become not only a strong man, but a superpower. Massive economic aid. Massive military aid. Massive transfer of cutting-edge military technology. Some from the front door, a lot from the back door. And Israel grows and prospers. But... In order to keep this Israel safe, safe, while it's growing, you had to create a new organization called the United Nations Organization.
You had to create something called the Security Council whose responsibility, whose responsibility is for international peace and security. And you had to give veto power to the United States in the Security Council. So that every time mankind came together to censure that Jewish state, the United States is there to cast a veto to protect the baby. It happened time and again, time and again, that the United States is protecting Israel. If there was any doubt that the United States has now taken over as the ruling state in the world, 1956 put an end to that. In 1956, Britain, France and Israel attacked Egypt took over the Suez Canal. The British, the, the American president was Dwight Eisenhower, General Dwight Eisenhower. He ordered Britain and France and Israel to withdraw. <coughs> and they had to withdraw. And the British government fell. So Anthony Eden had to resign. Very clearly, Britain is no longer the ruling state in the world. The United States has taken over. If you felt that the Soviet Union was on par with the United States, that they are two superpowers, that the United States is not the ruling state in the world, then the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, I think, put an end to that. Remember? Sparrow signed the Calypso as they turned them ships in the opposite direction. You were born at that time? Huh? Kennedy is the man for them. The Cuban Missile Crisis and the Soviet Union had to back down when the United States imposed unilaterally a quarantine around the island of Cuba. And so the United States is the new ruling state in the world. And the United States has a mysterious relationship with the state of Israel. Can anyone explain that? <coughs> About two weeks before September the 11th, there was an international conference on racism and racial discrimination in South Africa, in Durban. The whole world come, came together, combined, to pass a resolution, resolution censuring Israel in that world conference in Durban. Israel walked out of that conference. Guess who walked out with Israel? Colin Powell, the Jamaican. Yeah, who is supposed to be representing the black people of the United States of America. The black people of the United States of America invested heavily in that conference. For years they worked for it. And yet the United States of America walked out of the conference in solidarity with Israel. Can you explain do you have any means of political analysis, any tools of political analysis which can explain this mysterious relationship between the United States and the State of Israel? No, you cannot. No one can do it. None can explain except a man named Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the explanation? The Jal has completed a day which is like a year, and he's now in a day which is like a month. Phase two of his mission. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, I now come to the most important moment in this talk. I want to share with you my political and spiritual vibration here. And that is that I have come to the conclusion 
You know, Lloyd Best taught me a, a local expression. He said, when God wants to kill Bachaki, give him wing to fly. And uh, there is a similar statement like that in the Quran that Allah gives them. Staircases of silver and roofs of silver. They fly high until he brings them down. The United States is flying high now because it's about to crash. <coughs> yes. We are located at that moment in time when a day which is like a month is about to end and the day which is like a week is about to commence. When it does occur, it will confirm what I'm saying. When Britain became the ruling state in the world, <coughs> Britain took control of the money of the world. And the sterling pound was the international currency. Do you remember those days when we were studying? 1 pound 480, 2 pound 960, 3 pound 1440. When you went to school? Huh? Yeah. And then when the United States took over from Britain as the ruling state in the world, the United States could not be the ruling state in the world without taking control of the money of the world. And so the U.S. dollar replaced the sterling pound as the international currency. This took place at the Bretton Woods Conference, the Bretton Woods Accord in upstate New York. And I'm saying to you, if you look at the world of money, you would see the writing is on the wall. The, the Bretton Woods Accord is collapsing. It has already collapsed. And a new international monetary system is around the corner in which the U.S. dollar will disappear. And when the U.S. dollar crashes, the American economy will crash with it. Flying high. The Dow Jones flying high. I want to suggest to you that the September 11 attack on America bears an uncanny similarity to the attack, the terrorist attack of September, of, 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 the, of the summer of 1914. And that the events which are now unfolding in the world, the attack on Afghanistan, the attack on Iraq, <coughs> the new American imperium that is taking over the world, are all meant to serve one mission, to pave the way for the state of Israel to wage a big war. And as a consequence of that big war that Israel is going to wage, the territory of the state of Israel is going to dramatically expand to encompass the biblical frontiers of Israel, of the Holy Land. The Bible says, from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. That's not true. The Quran proves that that is false. The Holy Land does not exist from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates, that is false. But it's there in the Bible. They put it in. And so Israel has to wage a big war which will dramatically expand the territory of the state so that Israel will, swear, will, will, will control the Suez Canal tomorrow. And Israel will control the oil of the Gulf tomorrow. And there will be a concomitant attack on the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar collapses. And when it collapses, it will bring down the whole world of paper money with it. This is our lecture on Islam and the international monetary system. When Israel wages that big war, 
I expect that Israel will unleash weapons of warfare we've never seen before. And at the end of it, Israel will take over from the United States as the new ruling state in the world. But Israel cannot wage that war while still there are any significant obstacles in the way. And now put on your thinking caps. Which is the most significant obstacle which still stands in the way of Israel waging her big war? Is it a man named Osama bin Laden and his men hiding in caves in Afghanistan? Is it that blue-eyed stooge of the Yankee, a man named Saddam Hussein? Are they significant obstacles in the path of Israel? Is it Taliban in Afghanistan? Wake up! None of these are significant obstacles in the path of Israel. Israel has one major obstacle in its way that must be removed before Israel can wage that big war. And it is Pakistan's nuclear weapons capacity. And coupled with that is Iran's missile capacity. And so all the hullabaloo we are going through now, all the maneuverings on the chessboard of the world, are all intended to culminate with the destruction of Pakistan's nuclear capacity. That is around the corner. That's about to take place. Parvez Musharraf, of course, is playing a very significant role in it. <coughs> I expect that Israel will be able to wage a big war probably within the next five to ten years. But Allah knows best. When Israel wages that big war and re replaces the United States as a ruling state in the world, the first ruling state was Britain. The second ruling state was the United States. The third and the last would be this imposter, the state of Israel. I am suggesting to you that the Dajjal or the Antichrist would now have completed stage two, a day which is like a month, and would be commencing stage three, a day which is like a week, meaning a much shorter period of time. It is at this time that terrorism reaches its climax. They not only attacked Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, in an act of state terrorism that Washington did not see. They have now attacked and killed Abdulaziz Rantisi and they have declared that they're going to continue killing all those who dare to lift their hands against the state of Israel. This is the biggest terrorist of all in the world, the state of Israel. But CNN will never tell you that. When Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, it is at that time that Muslims and black Christian Africa, these two are brothers with each other, black Christian Africa, black Christian Africa, open their arms to Muslims. When we were being persecuted, when war on Islam was being waged in the lifetime of Nabi Muhammad and a Christian king, a Christian king, a black Christian king in Africa protected us. I will never send them back to you, he said. And he looked at Islam and he looked at Christianity and he said, that which divides us from you is no more than this line in the sand. The Negus of Abyssinia. So too it was at that time. So too again it is today. <coughs> the major attacks that Israel will launch <coughs> will be on Muslims. 
and black Christian Africans. The prophet said that a man will pass by a grave and would roll on the grave and would say, I wish I were in the grave rather than the dead man because of biting, relentless oppression. But it will not last forever. The Dajjal or the Antichrist would be born. He would grow up. He would become the ruler of the state of Israel. He would rule the world from Jerusalem the way George Bush is ruling from Washington. I expect this within the next 50 years or so, but Allah knows best. It's going to be a horrible 50 years ahead of us. Horrible. And then he will declare, I am the Messiah. And the Jews will accept him as the Messiah. And then he'll rub his hands and say, mission accomplished. It is at that time that the son of Mary will now come back, not before. Jesus cannot return until the Antichrist has completed his mission. The Christians of this country would do well if they would come to Islam so that Muslims can explain to them the subject of the Antichrist as it has been explained to them today, as never before explained to them. Jesus cannot return until the Antichrist has completed his mission. The Antichrist has completed almost two-thirds of his mission, but there is one-third still remaining. At that time, <coughs> the son of Mary comes down, and the true Messiah now kills the false Messiah. And then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy Gog and Magog and that's our next lecture, insha'Allah. So you've got to come back next month. <coughs> and then said the Prophet Muhammad alayhi just listen to these two hadiths and we'll be finished. He said, when you see the black flags coming from the direction of Khurasan, Afghanistan is part of Khorasan. He said, go and join that army. These are two ahadiths combined. Go and join that army. Even if you have to crawl over ice. These are his words. Go and join that army. Even if you have to crawl over ice. Because no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. And so go back home today with joy in your hearts, even while there are tears in your eyes for the immense suffering through which we are going. Go back home with joy in your heart that there is a tomorrow which is coming in which a Muslim army will liberate the Holy Land. The Prophet said, الْيَهُودِ You will most certainly fight the Jews. That's clear. Look at what they're doing today. woman, You will kill them. You will be victorious. These are his words. At that time, even the stones will speak. Ya Muslim, Hatha Yahudiyun wa ra'id is a Jew hiding behind me. Fata'ala faqtul. So come and kill him. Not all those who are fighting us in the Holy Land, those who are waging war, those who are engaged in a mountain of wickedness and oppression and godlessness, unprecedented in history, go and kill them. <coughs> so the Holy Land would be liberated. 
And then the Islamic State, the Holy State of Israel, of David and Solomon, will now be restored in the Holy Land. And that Holy Israel will become the ruling state in the world. And the Son of Mary will now rule the world from Jerusalem with a rule which will be eternal. And the religion of Abraham, the true religion of Abraham, would rule the world from the Holy Land. What Prophet Muhammad brought, Allah's blessings be upon him, is the religion of Abraham. And so we ask of you today, go back home and read the Quran once again. And see in the Quran the true religion of Abraham and accept it. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim. Wa tub alayna ya mulana inna ka anta tawab rahim. برحمتك يا رحمة رحمة آمين Britain, France, Russia, Germany, Austria, Hungary, that's five, that's five, number six, number six, uh -huh. who remembers number six? Number six was the Ottoman Islamic Empire, I mean we forget about it, six major powers in Europe. And the Holy Land was under the control of the Ottoman Islamic Empire. The Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. And the fingerprints or the footprints, which were of course manufactured, led to Russia. It was intended to lead to Russia. Like September 11 footprints or fingerprints was intended to lead to Arabs and Muslims. Hmm? And so Austria-Hungary declared war on Russia as George Bush attacked Afghanistan. And then Britain and France who had a defense treaty with Russia now came to the assistance of Russia and joined the war. And then Germany entered the war on the side of Austria-Hungary. And then the Ottoman Islamic Empire was pushed, shoved into the war on the side of Germany. And so the stage was set, as the stage is now set today after September 11th. And the big war took place. But strangely, <coughs> Britain was losing that war because Germany unveil a new weapon of war that had never been used before, the submarine. As Israel is going to unveil a new weapon of war tomorrow that has never been used before. And when Britain was on her knees, facing defeat, Britain which was the ruling state in the world, is now facing defeat. Then the German Jews went to the British government and said, let's make a deal. If you will promise to give us the Holy Land, we'll bring the United States into the war on your side. Britain said, deal. You will see all of this on the last day. And so the United States entered into the war. And Britain won the war. In the process, 
the Ottoman Islamic Empire was defeated, was dismembered, and the Holy Land was liberated for the Jews. And so an act of terrorism led to this strategic target being achieved, the liberation of the Holy Land. But now, the United States takes over from Britain as the new ruling state in the world. In the same way that Britain had a mysterious relationship with the Holy Land and with the Jews, the United States now has that mysterious relationship with the Holy Land and with the Jews. The first country in the world to recognize the state of Israel is the United States of America. Is that by accident? No, not after today's lecture. You'll never think it's by accident. The United States presents, <coughs> excuse me, presents the baby with everything that the baby needs to grow up to become not only a strong man but a superpower. Massive economic aid. Massive military aid. Massive transfer of cutting edge military technology. Some from the front door, a lot from the back door. And Israel grows and prospers. But, in order to keep this Israel safe, safe while it's growing, you had to create a new organization called the United Nations Organization. You had to create something called the Security Council who was responsibility, whose responsibility is for international peace and security. And you had to give veto power to the United States in the Security Council. So that every time mankind came together to censure that Jewish state, the United States is there to cast a veto to protect the baby. It happened time and again, time and again, that the United States is protecting Israel. If there was any doubt that the United States has now taken over as the ruling state in the world, 1956 put an end to that. In 1956, Britain, France and Israel attacked Egypt, took over the Suez Canal. The British, the, the American president was Dwight Eisenhower, General Dwight Eisenhower. He ordered Britain and France and Israel to withdraw. <coughs> and they had to withdraw. And the British government fell. So Anthony Eden had to resign. Very clearly, Britain is no longer the ruling state in the world. The United States has taken over. If you felt that the Soviet Union was on par with the United States, that there are two superpowers, that the United States is not the ruling state in the world, then the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, I think, put an end to that. Remember? Sparrow signed the Calypso, I said, turn them ships in the opposite direction. You were born at that time? Huh? Kennedy is the man for that. The Cuban Missile Crisis, and the Soviet Union had to back down when the United States imposed unilaterally a quarantine around the island of Cuba. And so the United States is the new ruling state in the world. And the United States has a mysterious relationship with the state of Israel. Can anyone explain that? <coughs> About two weeks before September the 11th, there was an international conference on racism and racial discrimination in South Africa, in Durban. The whole world come, came together combined 
to pass a resolution censuring Israel in that World Conference in Durban. Israel walked out of that conference. Guess who walked out with Israel? Colin Powell, the Jamaican. Yeah, who is supposed to be representing the black people of the United States of America. The black people of the United States of America invested heavily in that conference. For years they worked for it. And yet the United States of America walked out of the conference in solidarity with Israel. Can you explain? Do you have any means of political analysis, any tools of political analysis which can explain this mysterious relationship between the United States and the state of Israel? No, you cannot. No one can do it. None can explain except a man named Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the explanation? Dajjal has completed a day which is like a year and he's now in a day which is like a month. Phase two of his mission. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, I now come to the most important moment in this talk. I want to share with you my political and spiritual vibration here. And that is that I have come to the conclusion. You know, Lloyd Best taught me a, a local expression. He said, when God wants to kill Bachaki, give him wing to fly. And uh, there is a similar statement like that in the Quran that Allah gives them staircases of silver and roofs of silver. They fly high until he brings them down. The United States is flying high now because it's about to crash. <coughs> yes. We are located at that moment in time when a day which is like a month is about to end and the day which is like a week is about to commence. When it does occur, it will confirm what I'm saying. When Britain became the ruling state in the world, <coughs> Britain took control of the money of the world. And the sterling pound was the international currency. Do you remember those days when we used to study? 1 pound 480, 2 pound 960, 3 pound 1440, when you went to school? Huh? Yeah. And then when the United States took over from Britain as a ruling state in the world, the United States could not be the ruling state in the world without taking control of the money of the world. And so the US dollar replaced the sterling pound as the international currency. This took place at the Bretton Woods Conference, the Bretton Woods Accord in upstate New York. And I'm saying to you, if you look at the world of money, you would see the writing is on the wall. That the Bretton Woods Accord is collapsing. It has already collapsed. And a new international monetary system is around the corner in which the U.S. dollar will disappear. And when the U.S. dollar crashes, the American economy will crash with it. Flying high, the Dow Jones, flying high. I want to suggest to you that the September 11 attack on America bears an uncanny similarity to the attack, the terrorist attack of September 
of, 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 the, of the summer of 1914. And that the events which are now unfolding in the world, the attack on Afghanistan, the attack on Iraq, <coughs> the new American imperium that is taking over the world, are all meant to serve one mission, to pave the way for the state of Israel to wage a big war. And as a consequence of that big war that Israel is going to wage, the territory of the state of Israel is going to dramatically expand to encompass the biblical frontiers of Israel, of the Holy Land. Bible says, from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. That's not true. The Quran proves that that is false. The Holy Land does not exist from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates, that is false. But it's there in the Bible. They put it in. And so Israel has to wage a big war which will dramatically expand the territory of the state so that Israel will, swear, will, will, will control the Suez Canal tomorrow. And Israel will control the oil of the Gulf tomorrow. And there would be a concomitant attack on the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar collapses. And when it collapses, it will bring down the whole world of paper money with it. This is our lecture on Islam and the international monetary system. When Israel wages that big war, I expect that Israel will unleash weapons of warfare we've never seen before. And at the end of it, Israel will take over from the United States as the new ruling state in the world. But Israel cannot wage that war while still there are any significant obstacles in the way. And now put on your thinking caps. Which is the most significant obstacle which still stands in the way of Israel waging her big war? Is it a man named Osama bin Laden and his men hiding in caves in Afghanistan? Is it that blue-eyed stooge of the Yankee, a man named Saddam Hussein? Are they significant obstacles in the path of Israel? Is it Taliban in Afghanistan? Wake up! None of these are significant obstacles in the path of Israel. Israel has one major obstacle in its way that must be removed before Israel can wage that big war. And it is Pakistan's nuclear weapons capacity. And coupled with that is Iran's missile capacity. And so all the hullabaloo we're going through now, all the maneuverings on the chessboard of the world, are all intended to culminate with the destruction of Pakistan's nuclear capacity. That is around the corner. That's about to take place. Parvez Musharraf, of course, is playing a very significant role in it. <coughs> I expect that Israel will be able to wage a big war probably within the next five to ten years. But Allah knows best. When Israel wages that big war and re replaces the United States as a ruling state in the world, the first ruling state was Britain. The second ruling state was the United States. The third and the last would be this imposter. The state of Israel. I am suggesting to you that the Dajjal or the Antichrist would now have completed stage two, a day which is like a month, and would be commencing stage three, a day which is like a week, meaning a much shorter period of time. It is at this time that terrorism reaches its climax. 
they not only attacked Sheikh Ahmad Yassin in an act of state terrorism that Washington did not see, they have now attacked and killed Abdulaziz Rantisi, and they have declared that they're going to continue killing all those who dare to lift their hands against the state of Israel. This is the biggest terrorist of all in the world, the state of Israel. But CNN will never tell you that. When Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, it is at that time that Muslims and black Christian Africa, these two are brothers with each other, black Christian Africa, black Christian Africa, open their arms to Muslims when we were being persecuted, when war on Islam was being waged in the lifetime of Nabi Muhammad and a Christian king, a Christian king, a black Christian king in Africa protected us. I will never send them back to you, he said. And he looked at Islam and he looked at Christianity and he said, that which divides us from you is no more than this line in the sand. The negus of Abyssinia. So too it was at that time. So too again it is today. <coughs> the major attacks that Israel will launch <coughs> will be on Muslims and black Christian Africans. The Prophet said that a man will pass by a grave and would roll on the grave and would say, I wish I were in the grave rather than the dead man because of biting, relentless oppression. But it will not last forever. The Dajjal or the Antichrist would be born he would grow up. He would become the ruler of the state of Israel. He would rule the world from Jerusalem the way George Bush is ruling from Washington. I expect this within the next 50 years or so, but Allah knows best. It's going to be a horrible 50 years ahead of us. Horrible. And then he will declare, I am the Messiah. And the Jews will accept him as a Messiah. And then he rub his hands and say, mission accomplished. It is at that time that the son of Mary will now come back, not before. Jesus cannot return until the Antichrist has completed his mission. The Christians of this country would do well if they would come to Islam so that Muslims can explain to them the subject of the Antichrist as it has been explained to them today, as never before explained to them. Jesus cannot return until the Antichrist has completed his mission. The Antichrist has completed almost two-thirds of his mission, but there is one-third still remaining. At that time, <coughs> the son of Mary comes down, and the true Messiah now kills the false Messiah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy Gog and Magog, and that's our next lecture, inshallah. So you've got to come back next month. <coughs> and then said the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, just listen to these two hadiths and we'll be finished he said when you see the black flags coming from the direction of Khorasan Afghanistan is part of Khorasan he said go and join that army these are two hadiths combined go and join that army even if you have to crawl over ice, 
These are his words. Go and join that army. Even if you have to crawl over ice. Because no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. And so go back home today with joy in your hearts. Even while there are tears in your eyes for the immense suffering through which we are going. Go back home with joy in your heart. The day is a tomorrow which is coming. In which a Muslim army will liberate the Holy Land. The Prophet said, You will most certainly fight the Jews. That's clear. Look at what they're doing today. You will kill them. You will be victorious. These are his words. At that time, even the stones will speak. Ya Muslim, Haza Yahudiyun Waraid is a Jew hiding behind me. Fata'ala Faktul. So come and kill him. Not all those who are fighting us in the Holy Land, those who are waging war, those who are engaged in a mountain of wickedness and oppression and godlessness unprecedented in history, go and kill them. <coughs> so the Holy Land would be liberated. And then the Islamic State, the Holy State of Israel, of David and Solomon, will now be restored in the Holy Land. And that Holy Israel will become the ruling state in the world. And the Son of Mary will now rule the world from Jerusalem with a rule which will be eternal. And the religion of Abraham, the true religion of Abraham, would rule the world from the Holy Land. What Prophet Muhammad brought, Allah's blessings be upon him, is the religion of Abraham. And so we ask of you today, go back home and read the Quran once again. And see in the Quran the true religion of Abraham and accept it. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim. Wa tub alayna ya mulana innaka anta tawwab rahim. برحمتك يا رحمة الرحمن آمين